I'm green. Yep. I have to, you know, I have to peek through. They, they make these for men, so I'm peeking through here just to be sure I'm green. We're good. We're going to dig right in. There is not a more direct recipe for our success as women in the middle years, and I'm going to call this the marriage, child rearing, even up to the point of the birth of our grandchildren. I'm going to call that our middle years. And there is not a more direct recipe for women than in Titus chapter 2. We're going to go to the Word to find this recipe. But first I want us to notice that when we look at Titus chapter 2, I want you to envision a sandwich. And the meat of the Word is in the middle. And on each side of the meat of this word is something really important. In our sandwich, it's our bun or our bread. But look at verse 1 of chapter 2, and we have the top part of the sandwich. Speak the things which become sound doctrine is what it says in the King James Version. But do you know what the word sound means? Healthy. This is what's going to be healthy for you and for your congregations. He's telling Titus to speak the things that are healthy doctrine or teaching or instruction for life. What we have here is something that's important because it's not suggestions coming up. It's sound doctrine. And then we are going to read that sound doctrine in verses, the, the intervening verses, but the bottom of verse 5 is the other half of the sandwich. The bread on the bottom says you do these things so that the word of God will not be what? What? All right. Blasphemed is one, one word. Yours might say evil spoken of. But what this is, whatever it is that's in what we're about to talk about, the meat of the passage, is sound doctrine. And if we don't do it, the word of God will be blasphemed. How important is this, what we're about to study? Pretty important. And then we go to the very, if that's not enough, we go to the very last verse of the chapter. And Paul tells Titus, These things speak and exhort and rebuke with all what? Authority. Authority from where? Heaven, this is heaven's authority here. This is powerful stuff. This is what God intends for us to do as older and younger women. Now, the younger women here are going to be the ones who are in the middle years, and the older women are going to be the ones like me who are past the middle years. And it says here, the older women, verse 3, likewise, that they be in behavior as becomes holiness, or that they be reverent in demeanor, not slanderers, not given to much wine, teachers of those things that are good. So those are the kind of older women that we need. I want you to think about Crete just for a minute. That's where Titus lived. And this was written to Titus, who was the preacher at the, at the Crete Church of Christ. And in Crete, in this day, I'm telling you, it was not a wholesome society. Now, we look around and we think we've got some problems in Tilton, New Hampshire, or wherever we are. This was not a wholesome society. In fact, Paul said about it in Titus chapter 1, one of themselves, verse 12, even a prophet of their own said the Cretans are always liars. Well, that's not very politically correct. <laughs> I mean, well, I'd get in trouble if I said, oh, well, the people over until all those are liars. That's what Paul said here. By the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, the Christians are always liars, evil beasts, idle gluttons. That's not a very good description of those people. But history tells us, and he didn't mention this part here, but history does tell us, and we have a pretty, some pretty um, adept descriptions of Crete, and it was an island full of homosexuality, and not just homosexuality, but the upper crust of Crete was given to, the governors and rulers were given to sex with boys. 
And what they would do is, and this, this is a matter of history, they would have the boys come and pay their fathers a certain amount of money for letting them come and spend the weekend with them as rulers, the, the boys, the teenage boys. And then if they liked them, they would just buy them for sex slaves. And they would come up with a price and pay the fathers, and these boys would go into sex slavery to the rulers of the island. That's what that's the kind of place that Crete was. And there's a Crete Church of Christ. There's a body of believers in Crete that are trying to do the right thing, even though this is the kind of governorship that exists in Crete. There's God's people there trying to do the right thing. And he says here that there are some older women in that church, and we'll talk about older later, but for now we're just going to say they were holy. They were reverent in the way they viewed. They were able to be serious about serious things. They were not given to much wine. I'm just going to go ahead and say here that not given to much wine doesn't mean given to a little wine. It doesn't mean that. That's not what this passage says. And I could go other places and show you how that all recreational alcoholic beverages is, is purely counter to our Christianity. It's not what we're about. But the, this is not the place to do that. I think probably it says not given too much wine here because if he had said don't have any wine in your bodies, then they would have, have, to, given up, they would have to have given up their medicine. Old people would have had to have given up their medicine. I think that's probably why it says not given too much here. These, these women were women who were willing, able to teach good things on an island that was given over to pedophilia. Just telling you, there were some good women there. There's some good women here in this little village in New Hampshire. And we're going to talk about your responsibilities a little bit later, but right now I want to talk about if you're a, one, a younger woman, don't choose your mentors willy-nilly. Well, she's a member of the church. I think I'll hang out with her. She's 65 and she's a member of the church. And maybe she, don't choose willy-nilly. Mm-mm. Don't choose willy-nilly. There's some characteristics here to choose for your mentors. Why is this in the Bible? Because this is a testing ground. And there are some tutors. And they are identified here. And that's the kind of woman you're going to be looking for. You're going to be looking for people who meet the qualifications to be elders' wives. People who are evangelistic because they are holy in behavior and reverent in demeanor. You're going to be looking for people who are this kind of older women. And Titus, I'm telling you now, it's important, Titus 2 tells us where to look for our advice. It's not Dr. Phil, it's not Dr. Laura, it's not the President of the United States, it's not any governmental party. It's, it's right here. Older women who meet these qualifications. And it's not attending conventions where Beth Moore or Priscilla Shirer or Joyce Meyer, it's not those women. It's women who are in the church. It's those women. I really, I, I could get on a soapbox, but I'll just touch it. I am weary of going to congregations, big congregations, where women are going to take a bus to go hear Beth Moore. Beth Moore has some good ideas, but she's not in the body. She can't tell anybody how to get to heaven. It's not, and I do get tired of hearing women say, well, we have to study Priscilla Shirer, or we have to study K. Arthur because we, we, there aren't enough good books written by Christian women. Now, two things about that. There are, there are and many good books written by Christian women. And secondly, who says we have to study a woman all the time? There are a lot of good books written by Christian men some of them are written with the Holy Spirit's inspiration by Paul and Peter and Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. We don't have to be studying a woman all the time. 
But we better be studying verse 1 sound doctrine so that the word of God will not be blasphemed. I just want to get the basics here. So younger women, it then gives you some tenets of the pattern that we are to follow. And when I say younger women, I'm on the middle years. I, I think the Bible probably divides it up a little bit differently than, than we have today, but we're going to talk right now to these women who are, we know that they're, they're moms, they're at, the, at, at least in the childbearing years because it's talking about loving your husband, loving your children, being keepers at home. So we're, we're talking to this age group. So the tenets of the pattern. It's Mother's Day weekend. I just want us to think about why is it that women in the church can get so defensive when we talk about neglected homes and those mothers who have neglected them. It's something we have to address in a society where now more than ever, not only are moms forsaken homes for luxuries, but many times they are walking away from their children in a permanent fashion. We as women of God have to address that cultural challenge around us because we're living, in a sense, on Crete. We're living in a society that's forsaken the principles of God's word, gang violence, taking over our cities. I cannot believe that there are elements of our society now that believe it's okay to destroy people and property as long as you are standing up for some truth. There are, we have, we have sex trafficking and pornography are multi-million slash billion dollar industries in our country. Bigger pornography, bigger than all of the major sports Industries combined, the money that's made on pornography, the average age in which your little boy will be introduced to pornography, if he is average, is nine now, age nine. And we are living in a, in a society in which the basic institution, the basic institution, the one that was before the church, the home, is broken. And we as God's people have to decide that in order to fix our own personal homes, we can't be like the world around us. Because those characteristics of the world around us have broken our homes in America. And so we have to decide that not only are we going to be a little bit different, but we're going to be radically different. It used to be, it used to be in our country in the early last century that I could be kind of like the people, most of the people in my community around me and still be faithful. I was talking to somebody over this break who said, you know, I like the way it, it is down in the South where everybody says, have a blessed day. We're like that. We are like that more than you are here. We are more like that. More people will say, I'll be praying for you. Even if they're not members of God's kingdom, they'll say that. I, I think that this person has lived in both and has observed that it's not as much that way here as it is in the South. But I'm telling you, South, North, East, West, we have all, as cultures, moved away from God's Word to a secular society that I read about in the last lesson where people believe that we cannot know absolute truth. And our churches, get this, this is what the passage says, our churches will not be healthy. That's what the word sound means there. Our churches will not be healthy if the tenets that are prescribed for the home in this passage are not followed. And the word of God will be evil spoken of in our communities if we fall into the same traps as the world has fallen in with regard to morality and the home. That's what I want us to talk about in this hour. So what does it say here? It says that they may teach the younger women to be sober. The ASV omits that word. It's not in all the manuscripts, but whether or not it's in the manuscript, we need to be serious about serious things. That's a prerequisite to the next, the next tenet, which is to love our husbands. To love our husbands. I'm amazed that even needs to be said, but it does. It's here, this word is not agape, it is phileo. 
which means we are to be our husband's friends. There are some there is one word in our world today that would describe this kind of friendship. The one thing that your husband needs most from you is R E S P E C T. And it's a thing of the past in most of the homes in your community. We need to respect our husbands. That's going to eliminate nagging. Nagging is not only not respectful, it's not productive. How many women have you known who came to you and said, "Oh, we fixed all the marriages and our pro- all the problems in our marriage because I was a great nagger." <laughs> not productive. Not scriptural, not productive. It means we're not going to pout. We're not going to be those people, well, I don't nag. I just close my mouth and stop talking to my husband. I pout. It's not going to fix things. And it's not. There are some powders in the Bible. We, I, we don't have time to get into that. But pouting is going to one day put you in some circumstances that are going to be very sad for you if you love your husband, if you love him. I mean, he's going to be in a hospital room one day because he had a wreck, and you're going to be thinking, oh, man, I wasn't even nice to him this morning because you're in a habit of pout. Get out of that habit. Get out of that habit. I mean, one day, I my, my friend, her name was Cindy, too. She was fixing supper at home. Her husband was late getting home, and she said, she walked through the living room, and she heard the news, and it said there was a wreck on his way home, and she thought, that's why he's late. He's backed up in traffic. She went on cooking supper. The next time she walked through the living room, she saw his truck on the television. She immediately got in her car. She called me and said, meet me at the hospital. They said where they had taken him. So I did. I went to meet her, but by the time I got there... They were bringing out the wedding rings and handing them to my friend. And it fell my lot to go and tell her children, who were 10 and 11 at the time, that they would not see their father anymore in this lifetime. But I'll never forget the conversation that I had with her. I said, tell me. I was close enough to her to say this. I want you to tell me that everything was good this morning. He said, that's what I have. That's what I have for the rest of this lifetime. The last thing I said to him was, I love you, honey. The last thing he said to me was, I love you too. And you know what? This family was evangelistic. He was one of our deacons. They were given to the Lord's work. And that day, for the first time, he was going to the commissary. He worked on the military. He was going to the commissary to get tickets for them to go to a theme park. And they had never been before because all their money went to the missionaries. They didn't have cell phones because all their money went to the missionaries. And she said, he did call me just before he left work. And he said, I'm going to go get those tickets. And he said, I can't wait. And I love you. What if that had been a pouting day? I want you to stop pouting. If you're a powder, I just want you to stop. Lying is not respectful. Not only is lying and deceit, I'm going to put deceit in there too. Oh, tell the children, we're going to do this, but don't tell dad. Mm -mm. That's not respectful. That's teaching your daughter to have a failed marriage when she grows up. It's not respectful to lie. But I'm going to tell you not only that, lying is insurance, uh, telling the truth, is insurance against adultery. There will not be any adultery if both people are telling the truth all the time. If you are in the habit of always telling the truth, there will never be adultery in your marriage. I know I can't fix everybody. I can't fix your husbands in this room. They're not here. (laughs) But we can fix ourselves. Because remember what this is, a testing ground. And no matter how hard it is, I'm going to do it right. I'm going to vow to God to do it right. Faithfully, not perfectly, but faithfully. No matter how hard it is in my marriage, because I want heaven one day, because I married Jesus first. 
He's my first commitment. He's my prior commitment. He's my first marriage partner. And I'm going to be faithful to him. Speaking disrespectfully should not be a part of a marriage with phileo. I should speak respectfully to and about my husband. To and about. I used to say to my husband when he came home with sour cream instead of cottage cheese or with diced pineapple instead of whole pineapple when I was going to make the upside down, I used to say, oh, Glenn, you beat all. That's a southern thing, I guess. But my husband came in one day and he had the wrong thing and I said, oh, you beat all. And he said, I know maybe you haven't thought about this, but that just does not sound respectful to me. Guess who has never said you beat all again? You know what it is that sounds disrespectful to your husband. I might not know. But you know how to speak respectfully to and about him. I I remember we used to go visit some friends in when we lived in Jasper, Alabama, and they were good friends, and we played cards, and we grilled out, and we had always had such fun with them. But I'm telling you what, Penny, my friend, loved Billy, her husband, and she would let you know. I mean, all night long. Well, the, the, look at the girls. They're, they're sweeping the kitchen. She said, Billy, it's Billy. Billy's a great dad. Billy teaches them. And then, you know, the chicken. This chicken's really good. Oh, Billy, he can grill. I love my Bill. He can grill. And that rhymes. <laughs> I mean, and you, oh, well, look, y'all beat us. It's Billy. It's all Billy. He's a great card player. I, I don't know anything, but he, Billy. Billy's great. I love Billy. And we got in the car that night. I'll never forget. We got in the car that night. And we said, oh, that was fun. We loved it. We laughed a lot. And I said, but Glenn, I thought if she said, I love Bill one more time, I was going to throw up. (laughs) And you know what my husband said? I like it. (laughs) I thought it was nice. Love. Phileo. Love your husband. Speak respectfully to him and about him. Don't be a manipulator. Who was a who was a great manipulator in the Old Testament? Come on, you can talk. A woman. Jezebel was a great manipulatress. Delilah was a great, very good. It's lying, it's crying, it's begging, it's withholding sex or offering sex. Don't be a manipulatress. That's not respectful. And besides that, which takes the stronger woman? The woman who decides to do it God's way or the woman who decides to use that power that God has given her in with ulterior motives to get what she wants? Stronger woman's the woman who does it God's way. Be a strong woman. Be joyful in intimacy. Be loyal. I wish I had a long time. We could just do a whole wife seminar here. Not that I'm perfect at it, but because I need to review it all the time, and you do too. This is what God's Word says. And here's here's the do's. Be respectful at all times. But this is the hard one. Do everything he says. Cindy Colley, I can't believe you just said that. Do everything my husband, that's what I said. Everything except if it makes you violate the will of Christ. Because you married Christ first. He's the prior commitment. But the Bible says, oh, listen to these verses now. Ephesians chapter 5 says, Be respectful to your husbands. Actually, it says be in subjection, King James Version, to your husbands in all things. And then at the bottom part of that chapter, the last verse or two, it says there, let the wife see that she reverence her husband. And then we turn over to Titus chapter 2 where it's about to say, be obedient to your own husbands, obedient. Colossians chapter 3, King James is, submit to your husband as it is fit in the Lord. And 1 Peter chapter 3 where it says, have a meek and quiet spirit of submission And then it says, even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. 
I'm just telling you, or master, I'm just telling you, we can say a lot of things. We can say it doesn't fit our culture. We can say, oh, but that would never work at my house. My husband's not a leader. This is going to uh, make my children have a different view from the one they're learning at school and in our society. It's not going to work. At we can say a lot of things, but we can never say that obedience, biblical submission in the home is not what God has ordered, has prescribed, because it is. I, I, I'm going to go ahead and say that you know, though it is unpopular today, though it is not what culture suggests today, um, some of my friends who are Christians, who are members of the kingdom, I should say, have suggested to me that these passages that command submission and obedience were just cultural. That was just for Paul's culture. That was just because Paul wasn't married. He felt that way. <laughs> Okay, let's just think about it for a minute. Let's just think about passages. I know that that is not true because in 1 Timothy chapter 2, when it's talking about submission, especially in a worship context, but it's talking about submission in general too, it ties it all the way back to Adam and Eve, the Garden of Eden. It says, because, this is why, because Eve was first in the transgression. There's a lot of things we could say about that, but because of time, I'm not going to. But whatever it is, it ties the concept all the way back to the Garden of Eden. Then when Peter's talking about it in 1 Peter chapter 3, who does he tie it to? Sarah. Even as Sarah obeyed Abraham. So we've got it. We've got it going for the culture of Eve. We've got it going for the culture of Sarah, which was hundreds of years apart. We've got it going for the culture of Paul and Timothy and Peter. And Peter was married. And we have it going for the culture of all time because it wasn't a cultural teaching. It just wasn't. And then some people say, and I was sitting across from a preacher the other day who said to me, Cindy, you know, all that obeying in all things, it's really only spiritual things. The husband is just supposed to have spiritual leadership. Is that true? That's not true. And how do I know? I know that from 1 Peter 3. Because there, he was writing this instruction to somebody who was married, to women who were married to heathen men. Men who did not even respect God at all. And he says, you be obedient to them. And you might bring them to the Lord that way. That's what the passage says. So, how much of a spiritual leader was that heathen man going to be? Not. Just not. So it wasn't written. about. Now get this. Is delegated authority a good thing that a husband can do? My husband does not tell me what kind of cookies to bake. He does not tell me what color to paint the wall. He does not tell me where to hang a picture. He does come back behind me and rehang it after I hang it on. <laughs> After I hang it on a straight pin and it falls, he says, oh, let me find you a stud. I appreciate that. But you know what? There's delegated authority. But if my husband told me to bake peanut butter cookies, what would my responsibility be? To bake peanut butter cookies. Biblically. That's just how it is. Now, I'm not telling you to say to your husband, you beat me. So I'm going to lay down on the bed, beat me some more. I'm not saying that. There are, way, there are laws. There are legal systems that we can use. There are things we can do and should do to avoid abuse. But what I'm saying is God's word commands us to be obedient to our husbands until he's asking us to do something that Christ would have us to not do. So... Before I leave marriage and start talking about children, and, you know, you really have two minutes here. Hmm. <laughs> Are they going to hold the plane for me today? <laughs> Some people say, but, but I know God wants me to be happy, and I just don't feel that chemistry anymore. Make sure you get it. 
Bible is not about chemistry. The Bible is about commitment. There will be days. There absolutely will be days when you don't feel it. But you made a commitment. And the commitment feeds the love, not the other way around. Young people used to say, oh, we're going all the way. When they meant debauching and messing up what God put in mar- intimacy, God reserved for marriage. People used, you know what? Going all the way is sitting beside his bed when he's in the nursing home and he doesn't even know who you are and feeding him and hydrating him. That's going all the way. But then it says to love your children. <sighs> I'm amazed that I need to say this in this in any culture that women are supposed to love their children, but did the Holy Spirit know about abortion? Yeah. Did the Holy Spirit know about babies in the freezer who have been abandoned by people who are members of God's kingdom? I know those situations. God knew about it. Did the Holy Spirit know, this is closer to home, about women choosing luxuries over time nurturing and teaching their own children? The Holy Spirit knew about it. He must have known because he then commanded that you love your children and be keepers at home. Keepers, oikuros, keepers at home. I get in a lot of trouble when I talk about this. The two things that I talk about that women, three things that women hate the most is why did God command me to be oikuros, a keeper at home? Why do I have to do that? Why do I have to come on Wednesday nights? And why can't I go to the prom? And why a four? And why do I need to dress modestly? See, because it's this culture around us. It's just this culture around us. But I'm just going to read you the definition. And it's not difficult, and it's not full of big words. Here's what the Holy Spirit says, regardless of what else you are. Here's what the Holy Spirit says you have to be. Caring for your house. Working at home. This is Strong's definition. The watch or the keeper of the house. Keeping at home and taking care of household affairs. A domestic. And that is healthy teaching. And it is so that the word of God will not be blasphemed. I don't need to comment on that. We just need a priority. Deuteronomy 6 does say for the Old Testament people that there's a way that they could ensure that their children and their children's children walk in the ways of the Lord. Raise your hand if you're in the middle years and you'd like for that to happen. Your children and your children's children to walk in the ways of the Lord. And then it says how? You love him with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind. And you teach your children diligently. Teach, not in a didactic sense. It's a conversation there. It's a wedding of a stone, really. Over and over and over. You teach your children diligently four times in the day when they're standing up, when they're sitting down, when they're walking, and when they go to bed at night. That's about every posture but a handstand. (laughs) And it takes T-I-M-E. And by the way, that's how children spell love is T-I-M-E. I'm just going to keep saying it because I'm a child advocate. And because God's word has the word oikuros in it, and it has a definition. And it's not what our society around us is doing. We can't have healthy churches if we don't have these things. How do I know this? Because the Holy Spirit said it, but I could figure it out. I could figure out, even if the Holy Spirit hadn't said this, that we will have more successful elders and more successful sheep submitting to those elders if they learn the principles of God's word about submission in the home as they are growing up. I can figure that out. I can figure out that we'll be raising men to be kind and godly but but bold leaders when we get this authority principle right at home. I can figure out that our churches will be struggling less with divorce and our teens will be less likely to walk away from the church. 
it's real, it's at home, and it makes for healthy churches. Now, the rest of this passage, I'm just going to take a couple of minutes to talk about sexual holiness. Sexual holiness. Now, I left the wording that way on purpose because God built a wall, an impregnable wall around the marital intimacy, and he made it so high and so thick and so impressive that only one thing biblically can break the union of a marriage, and that is sexual unholiness. That is the commission of adultery by one spouse, or the, that's the only, and death. Those are the only things that can break the wall, that God put up around marital intimacy. And so churches today just become lackadaisical about sexual holiness. I mean, they look the other way when that which is holy is profaned right under their noses. Someone does come to place membership in your congregation, and they are on the fourth marriage, and there are stepchildren and half-siblings, and they live here and here, and you know that it's the fourth marriage, and so the elders just say, well, we're not going to talk about it. We're just not going to ask them about their other marriages, and if their marriage right now is holy, is that loving? That's not loving. That's not loving. Because the Bible teaches there is such a thing as a marriage that is adulterous. And so we do the 1 Corinthians 5 thing and we just glory in sexual unholiness? I mean, biblically, we have to address sexual unholiness. Or like the other day, I went to speak at a ladies' day and over here, if this was actually, I spoke at the ladies' day and then I worshiped with the congregation on Sunday morning and they, these folks introduced me and this was a couple here and she was leading, she led the prayer at the ladies' day and she introduced me to her husband and then this couple over here, and this lady was the photographer at the ladies' day, and she introduced me to her husband. And then this wife said, but I used to be married to him. They're all worshiping together. Children are moving pews because this is their mom and this is their dad, and there's two couples. I'm telling you what, something's wrong with that picture. Somebody is living in adultery. Two people are living in adultery. When that occurs, uh, nobody's dead. And so that impregnable wall that God put has been violated and nobody is addressing it. Something is wrong with that picture. So let's keep each other accountable. Let's praise God if you have elders who keep people accountable for sexual holiness. The words are in this passage be chaste and discreet, it's sound doctrine. That means I am not going to engage in electric conversations. Electric conversations, you know what they are. You throw something out there that's a little bit risque. could be taken two ways, but I'm going to see how he takes it. I'm going to see if he's open to a little flirtation. He's going to see if she's open to it. Don't engage in electric conversations. Don't even say anything that approaches that. My husband says it this way. He got on an elevator with a lady one day, and they were riding up to the 13th floor of the hospital, and he said, I know the elevator rules. You're supposed to cross your arms, listen to the music, and don't say anything. But this lady said, mm, you smell good. She probably didn't mean anything by that. He says, I did smell good. <laughs> But, but he said, thank you. That is my wife's favorite cologne, and she bought that for it. Throw your spouse into the conversation <laughs> because you just throw cold water on any flirtation, and my husband could go to bed that night and know even if she did mean something off-color that he did not participate. Don't engage in electric conversations. Remove yourself from any potentially compromising circumstance. If you find yourself attracted to someone, go to the other end of the world. I mean, sometimes the best defense against fornication is a good pair of Nikes and the King's Highway. You get out of there. Remove yourself. And it's unlike other sins. It's unlike them. Sometimes it's good to pray about things together. But you do not say... Oh, I'm attracted to you. Let's pray about this. <laughs> no! You just removed... Joseph left his coat. He got out of there. You get out of there. Because you'll do something you'll regret deeply. And you'll do something that will potentially keep your children's souls out of heaven. 
you don't want it to go there. I mean, I sat down with a lady the other day, and she said, Cindy, I knew it was wrong. I knew it was. But she said, my boss wanted me to go on this work trip. And I knew her husband was an elder. I knew that I was attracted to this man. But she said, I thought I could do it. She said, what I did was I just decided before I left that I would not ever be alone with him, ever, on the trip. And she said, I kept my word until I was at the airport the night I was supposed to fly out. And they said, I have to spend the night at the airport. My flight was delayed. He said, so I sat there. I was trying to sleep. And she said, this man walks in the airport. And she said, wait, you're not flying out till in the morning. He said, I know, but I couldn't sleep. And so I just came to get some work done on my computer. So I'm just going to sit here and get some work done. And he said, why are you here? You were flying out. Wasn't your flight tonight? And I said, yeah, my flight was tonight, but it was delayed. And so I've got to spend the night in the airport. He said, wait. He said, I haven't. My, my room's still paid for. Just go spend the night there. Get some sleep. He said, well, I've already turned in my car. He said, well, I'll run you back over there. He threw it all away. He got in the car, breaking her rule, with a man that she said she would never be alone with. And it was the beginning of the end of happiness for her family. Don't throw it away. Don't take those risks. You know, somebody told me this morning that we're in a, in a congregation here where there are, there are rules in place where there aren't going to be women alone. I don't care if she's taking, he's taking her to the hospital or picking up somebody at the hospital or going to school to pick up a child. or what, There's not going to be men and women alone. That's a great rule. Every congregation should, should have a rule. I wish I had a lot of time, but I don't have a lot of time. Close the door to voices that disparage the marriage that's God approved. Sometimes we get unhappy for a few days or weeks or months, even in those marriages, and we start listening to people say, well, I wouldn't put up with that. i get out of that. You remember as a Christian, that is the only marriage you are ever going to have that's God approved. The grass is not greener somewhere else. Ask your elders to care about the holiness of marriage. I know we have people from lots of congregations. Ask them to care about the holiness of marriage. Matthew 19, 9 is not hard to understand. We have to have help to misunderstand what Jesus said in Matthew 19, 9. But the most valuable contribution you can probably make is to raise up children who respect the holiness of marriage, who are going to stand for it, who are going to choose eligible partners for marriage, See, we're either, as women in the middle years, we're either raising up the answers to the problems in the church today or we are raising up the intensification of them. I want us to be raising up the answers in a society that has rejected God's laws of marriage. For our purposes, we're always going to go to the pattern. we got a pattern here in Titus chapter 2. That's in a sandwich. We need to stop thinking more that we know more as women about the economy of home and family than the older women who are faithful and meet these qualifications do. Can't let Twitter be your God. Can't let Googling be your God. Can't let the Republican Party or the Democratic can't let any of that be our God. God gave you a pattern in all things. All things, not the good, not just the Good things, but the good things and the bad things work together for good to those who love him and are called according to his purpose, or we can even put pattern there. Let's do the pattern and be blessed for it. Thank you.